A text like this lends itself easily to a sermon with four to five points on how to pray like Daniel. Uh, you could say, okay, here's adoration, uh, there's, there's confession there, and there's humility, and so on. Uh, but and, and this, that wouldn't be wrong in this case. Uh, that, this is a, a truly exemplary prayer. This is a model prayer that is actually echoed in other parts of Scripture. We see that in Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9. Um, but if we are going to understand the 70 weeks prophecy that comes as a result, as a response to this prayer, we're going to need to dive in a little deeper into this prayer and into Daniel's mind as he's praying this. Now, as you can see, I've titled this sermon, Taking Hold of God. This phrase comes from Isaiah 64, 7, and I'll read it in its context. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind carry us away. There is no one who calls on your name, who awakens himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have melted us into the hand of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. So Isaiah laments the fact that there is no man who can awaken himself to take hold of God, as it were, that is to call on his name. Because by nature, all of us, apart from the grace of God, are spiritually dead. We are unclean and have no righteousness of our own. And all of us, by nature, coast away from the true God like a dry leaf in the wind. And Daniel knows that like all mankind, this is Israel's greatest problem, that they as a nation cannot turn to the Lord in repentance and faith because their sins carry them away. And this isn't news to Israel. Moses told them a long time ago that their heart was indeed the problem. At the end of his life, he says to Israel, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. And this has been true throughout Israel's history to this day. But Isaiah finds comfort in the fact that the sovereign Lord is the potter. And if he wills, he can change their hearts so that they would turn to him in such a way that they would never turn their backs to him again. God can do that. He's done that for us in this room. And so the only way for Israel to return to the Lord is for God himself to cause his people to return to him. And though a remnant of Israel does eventually return to the land, we find that they quickly soar right back into their sin and worse than before. And so the question is, what good is it to be restored to the land only to break the covenant all over again? And that's really how the Old Testament ends. And so if God is going to be faithful to his unconditional covenant promises, and he is, then somehow he must deal with Israel's sin for all time. And that is exactly what he has promised to do. And in Daniel 9, we find the answer to Israel's sin problem. And the answer comes in response to this very prayer. And we'll get to that more next week. But before then, we need to lay some groundwork. So let's dive in. Daniel, first of all, perceives God's promise. He perceives God's promise, verses 1 and 2. He says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So this new section in Daniel begins with him reading the word of God. And truly, this man knew his Bible. 
He knew the history. He knew the covenants and the promises. And we don't have time to cross-reference every verse, but just know that this prayer is completely saturated with the Word of God from beginning to end. And so it's no surprise that we find him reading the Word of God. And he's doing so in the first year of this new king, Darius, right after the fall of Babylon, which would place us around 538 B.C., And we've already noted in the past that it's likely that Darius the Mede is a title for Syaxares II, and it says he was made king. And back in chapter 531, it says he received the kingdom. Now, ultimately, God is the one who raises up and brings low, but he uses means. And according to one historian, Cyrus, who is the nephew of Syaxares II, actually did give him the kingdom of Babylon But Syaxares died about a year or two later. And it says that Daniel perceived in the books the number of years. Does that mean that Daniel saw something beyond the plain text of Scripture, beyond the black and white words of the Bible, some deeper meaning? No, he just took the Bible at face value. It says plainly in Jeremiah 29 and 25 that 70 years is the time limit for Israel to be in Babylon. And so after 70 years, they can expect that God will be faithful to fulfill that promise. And yet, Daniel still prays that he would do it. That's the whole point of this prayer. Lord, do what you said you would do. And so Daniel takes hold of God by taking hold of his word. So number one, Daniel perceives God's promise. And number two, He receives it. This is the text. Let's see. There you go. He receives God's promise. Verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord, to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. That's a fascinating transition. The NASB and the LSB have so, so I turned my face to the Lord. Daniel reads the promise and then we'll find that he prays ultimately for the fulfillment. Now, did Daniel think that somehow God would not be faithful to fulfill his promise at the end of 70 years? No, this fervent prayer flows out from a confidence that his sovereign God would do exactly as he promised in his word. And this brings up a good question. If God is sovereign, why pray? Really, the question is, if God is not sovereign, why pray? But how does God bring to pass the things he has sovereignly decreed? And the answer is he uses means. And he often uses the means of the prayers of his people. Now this doesn't mean that we sit back and wait for a divine zap to spur us on to pray. No, the Lord commands us to pray and that is enough. And he commands us to pray continually and to pray persistently and to pray for what we need. We are commanded to pray. And really prayer is as natural to the Christian as breathing. And so if you're not praying, examine yourself to see if you've really been born again. Now here's a question for you. Did Jesus know that God's name will ultimately be hallowed, that is glorified? Yes. Did Jesus know that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that his kingdom will come? Yes. And yet he told us to pray for those things. God is sovereign and we are to pray. We take hold of God's word and bring his promises to him in prayer and watch how they transform us. That's really what prayer does. It doesn't inform God, it transforms us. Prayer doesn't change God or his decree, but prayer does change things. God uses the means of prayer to bring about the things that he has ordained. This prayer was answered the very moment Daniel turned his face to the Lord. Verse 23 tells us that God sent the angel Gabriel with an answer to this prayer at the very beginning of it. And so Daniel didn't tell God anything he didn't already know. God's will was not changed by anything Daniel said, but Daniel's prayer was part of the divine plan. God doesn't have to use the means of prayer, but he delights to do so for his glory and for our good when we seek out his word and bring his promises to him and say, Lord, you are faithful to your promise. Here, this is a promise. Do as you've said 
for your glory. That is a prayer that takes hold of God. So God not only planned Israel's restoration, but he also planned their participation in it through the means of prayer. And just as a side note, prayer isn't all about asking for things, right? Daniel doesn't make any requests until verse 16, and I like what R.C. Sproul said about this in connection with God's sovereignty in prayer. He says, God's sovereignty casts no shadow over the prayer of adoration. God's foreknowledge or determinate counsel does not negate the prayer of praise. The only thing it should do is give us greater reason for expressing our adoration for who God is. If God knows what I'm going to say before I say it, his knowledge, rather than limiting my prayer, enhances the beauty of my praise. And he's right. He's right. Now it says, Daniel prayed with his face to the Lord, which means he prayed toward Jerusalem. That was his custom. Three times a day, he would open his windows toward Jerusalem and get on his knees and pray. And you say, why does he do that? Well, because again, Daniel knew his Bible. In 1 Kings 8, Solomon prays, if they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carried them captive, and pray to you toward their land, toward their land, then here in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer, and their plea. And so Daniel takes God at his word, and so he prayed toward Jerusalem every single day, three times a day. But he didn't just turn his body, no, by God's grace, he turns his heart to the Lord. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment prayer while he's cooking dinner or traveling somewhere, which, by the way, is perfectly fine. Uh, We're commanded to pray without ceasing. But there are times and circumstances that require us to set everything else aside and to pour out all that we have before God in prayer. And that's what Daniel's doing. Daniel prepares for this prayer with fasting for who knows how long. And he put on sackcloth and ashes, which signify his grief and his humility. And he's not just going through the motions. Daniel has been preparing his heart for this prayer, and he leaves nothing undone that would make his prayer more pleasing in the sight of God. He, he really couldn't bow lower than he is in his own estimation of himself, in his own mind. And then he begins his prayer. In verse 4, he says, I prayed to the Lord my God. Yahweh, my God, and make confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. In the entire book of Daniel, nowhere does he use God's covenant name except in this chapter. And he uses it eight times in this chapter, seven times in this prayer alone. So when you see capital L-O-R-D on the screen, it's really Yahweh in the Hebrew, his covenant name. So Daniel begins his confession by acknowledging who God is, and that is a great way to begin prayer in acknowledgement of who God is, in adoration of who he is, as he has revealed himself in his word. And make sure you get that last piece there. If you don't come to the God who's revealed himself in this Bible, then you've come to the wrong God. And you can be sure you're not even praying. You're just talking to yourself. And know that if you are not in union with Christ, his son, no amount of head knowledge will get you access to the Father. Because as Isaiah says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. But if you're in Christ you know you can have confidence to enter the presence of God through his blood. The veil has been torn for all who are in Christ, and you can go to your heavenly Father. But keep in mind that there is a balance in prayer. We don't just waltz into the throne room of the sovereign God of the universe. Yes, he is our Father, and he is gracious and compassionate and merciful and long-suffering, but he's also not to be trifled with. That word, For awesome, the great and awesome God, it means awful. It means terrible. Not that God is terrible, but that he incites terror and fear and awe. 
And so, yes, we can come before the throne of grace with confidence because of Christ, but we tread carefully because he is holy. And so we prepare our hearts and our words before we come to him in prayer. And if you want to know how to pray well, learn the attributes of God. That's my shameless plug for our student groups. Now, notice that Daniel says that God keeps covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments. That comes right out of Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Again, Daniel knew his Bible. Daniel understood that God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And listen, he is not saying that God will break his covenant if Israel breaks theirs. That's not what he's saying. Not at all. On the contrary, the bulk of Daniel's prayer is an acknowledgement that God has kept his covenant promise because Israel has failed. God was faithful to bring the covenant curses on Israel, and so this is not conditional language. In fact, if you go back to Deuteronomy 7, where Daniel is quoting, you'll find that the phrase does not refer to God's faithfulness to the Mosaic covenant, which is is a conditional covenant, but it refers to the Abrahamic covenant, which is unconditional. Daniel knows that God will be faithful to all his promises. God is being faithful to the Mosaic covenant in exiling them, but he will also be faithful to the Abrahamic, ultimately blessing the nation of Israel in the promised land for all time. And so Daniel grounds his prayer for God to restore Israel on that unconditional covenant He knows he has no grounds to stand on if he looks to the law. Now, when Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, that is not a conditional statement. It is a statement of fact. Those who love Christ will certainly keep his commandments, although not yet perfectly. And I'll say it this way Your obedience doesn't get you into God's unconditional covenant love. Your obedience is the evidence of God's covenant love for you, his unconditional covenant love for you. And so sin, your sin, doesn't kick you out of the new covenant because you've been brought into an unconditional covenant through the seed of Abraham, namely Christ. Now the prophets knew that God had yet to give his chosen nation a new heart, a heart that does keep his commandments And again, this is Israel's greatest problem, that they don't have new hearts that love Yahweh, the true God. And were it not for the Abrahamic covenant, Israel would have been wiped out as a nation a long time ago because Scripture tells us that they have committed iniquity more than the nations around them, more than Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest. And so what Daniel confesses in verse 5 comes as no surprise to anyone. He says, we have sinned. And done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. And take note, this is the right way to confess your sins. Daniel leaves no sin unconfessed. He brings before the Lord every single way they have sinned in his sight. There's no blame shifting. There's no minimizing sin by calling it a mistake. He is saying exactly what the Lord has said about their sin in his word. And so Daniel sees his sin and the sin of the nation for what it really is, which is a great place to be when you acknowledge reality as God has determined it. When you call a mistake what God calls sin, or when you call not a sin what God calls sin, you can be sure you are not operating according to what is true. Or when you call acceptable what God calls detestable, you are deceiving yourself. But Daniel knows the truth, and he confesses the truth as dark as it is, and this finds favor in the sight of God when we agree with him and cry out to him on the basis of who he is and what he has said in his word. And so Daniel says in verse 7, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, 
to those who are near, to those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. In other words, Daniel is saying that uh, open shame belongs to every Israelite everywhere. He says, this exile, we deserve it. Lord, you are right to punish us. And friends, this is true confession. This is true repentance. Daniel receives the consequences of sin. Israel was as wicked as can be, and God gave them exactly what they deserved. He gave them exactly what he promised to give them. And so Daniel says, I receive these promises. We have received your promise. You were faithful to bring them. But look at the next verse. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. What's he saying? Daniel's saying, not only is this right, but he's saying, God, you have given us far better than we deserve. You have shown mercy and forgiveness. And we see this, something similar to this in Ezra 9. This is after some Jews return to the land. And it says this, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved, shall we break your commandments again. Daniel is saying, Lord, you are showing mercy because this is much better than we deserve. We deserve far worse. What you did to Sodom, you should have done to us, and yet here we are. And I don't know about you, but when I sin, this is often what I think. I say, Lord, you are showing mercy and grace because I've checked my heart and it's still beating. Lord, you are gracious. I should have died with that thought. I should have perished with those words or with how I acted. Friends, we should have perished a thousand times this morning, but God is merciful and forgiving because we have sinned against him. Daniel goes on. He says, And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. Daniel really confesses the same sins again And do you guys ever do that when you sin? You say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, have mercy, have mercy. And you confess over and over again because it seems like once just isn't enough. And maybe that's how Daniel feels. And then he adds, and the curse and the oath, it's a promise, that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. God has confirmed his words. He's been faithful to his promise. Here's a question for you. Was the Mosaic Covenant ever intended to save? No. No, then what would obedience to the Mosaic Covenant do if not save? Obedience to the Mosaic Covenant would have kept and blessed Israel in the land until they failed. And disobedience would have kicked them out and and brought upon them all the curses spelled out in the law. And so Daniel is saying God was faithful to his promise of judgment and we have received that promise. We received the curses that he said he would bring. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything that has been done like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. I don't have time to read the curses in Deuteronomy 28, but I encourage you to read it on your own time and you'll see that Daniel is not using hyperbole. If God was faithful to bring about all the promises that he said he would, all the curses, and he was, then truly there has been no nation that has suffered more than the Jewish nation and lived. What Daniel is saying here is true. God will be faithful to all his promises in his word, including those of judgment. And you'd think that if you were currently meeting the requirements to receive God's promised judgment, you would hasten to find a way to appease the one who would bring that judgment. But that's not how the spiritually dead operate. Look at how Israel responded when they were in the very midst of the judgment, of the curse. 
Daniel says, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and acting wisely in your truth. That's repentance and the outworking of faith. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity. He has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous, righteous in all, that, in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. <clears throat> and I want to pause here and say, when God brings his judgment, it is righteous. And listen, it may well be that in this very room, there may be people who God has been storing up wrath. He's, he's kept ready the calamity as it were. And if or when his wrath breaks over you, you will know that it is righteous. You will know that God is righteous in bringing that judgment because all of heaven and earth, all the holy angels and glorified saints will say amen to that judgment, to your condemnation. They will say, God is righteous in bringing this judgment. God is faithful to all his promises. And so know that if you remain in the state that you're in, if you're outside of Christ, here is one promise that is for you. The author of Hebrews says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, that's the gospel, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That's his promise for all who do not believe and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying you're saved by works. We're justified by faith alone, but faith without works is dead. It's not true faith. That needs to be stressed in this city, this county, because so many people claim to be Christian, but their lives tell a different story. And there will be worse punishment for those who knew the gospel and then persisted in their sin. Look at this text again. He goes on. He says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Setting aside the Mosaic Covenant is one thing, but to trample underfoot the covenant which the Son of God died to bring, you are essentially trampling Christ under your feet. Now, there's no clear, tangible evidence or warning from God like being exiled to let us know when we are out of the sphere of His covenant blessing. But God does discipline those He loves. And so if you find that you can persist in a habitual lifestyle of sin, an unrepentant sin, without God intervening, be warned. If that's you, please come and find an elder after this service. Now, for the nation of Israel, even in the midst, in the very midst of receiving this judgment, there was no repentance, there was no uh, remorse, there was no turning to the Lord. They persisted in their idolatry and in their immorality. Over and over again in Scripture, we, we see the call to turn from sin and turn to the Lord, but sin does not do that. Sin does not call on his name because, again, our sins carry us away. And so if any one or any nation is to be saved, is to turn to the Lord, God must act. So Daniel perceives God's promise of the 70 years. He receives God's promise of judgment. And third, Daniel pleads for God's promise. It kind of rhymes. Daniel transitions now from confessing sin to making his request. And this is great. How does Daniel make his request known? On what grounds does he ask the Lord to act? He says, And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteousness, let your anger and your wrath 
turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake. For your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you on account of any righteousness of our own, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, for your own sake, oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Do you guys see where he's coming from? Do you see what's going on here? Daniel says, these are your people. This is your city. This is your sanctuary. The glory of your name is on the line. Answer this prayer for the sake of your glory. This is a prayer that takes hold of God because it takes hold of his word and seeks his glory. God does all things for his glory. We would be here until next week if we went through all the passages in scripture where God says he has acted or will act solely for the glory of his name. But I'll just give you two, two passages that pertain to Daniel's situation. The first one is in Isaiah 48. The Lord says, For the sake of my name, I delay my anger. And for my praise, I restrain it for you in order not to cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will ask, act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? And then Ezekiel 36, in the context of the new covenant, and this will be important for next week when we get into the 70 weeks, this is what we read. He says, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says Lord Yahweh, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you have come, I will prove the holiness of my great name. Keep that in mind which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares Lord Yahweh, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. And I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to do my judgments and you will inhabit the land that I gave your fathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. God will do all of this. God promised to gather Israel back to the promised land. Why? For the sake of the glory of his name. Not for their sake, but for his glory. And Daniel's plea is for this promise, for the glory of God's name to be realized. He's saying, Lord, bring us back for your own sake. Let the nations know that you alone are God, a righteous, covenant-keeping, and faithful God. Lord, open your eyes to what the nations are saying about you and vindicate your great name. Get glory for yourself, O Lord. That's his prayer. That's his prayer, and that's the bird's eye view. But let's take it apart. Let's go back and verse, start in verse 15. He says, And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself. So Daniel recalls the time when the Lord made a name for himself by delivering Egypt, sorry, Israel from Egypt, with signs and wonders and a mighty hand. And all the nations feared this God. You remember that in Scripture. All the nations were afraid of Yahweh, this God of Israel. And that was a glory to him. And then God took his redeemed people and brought them into a covenant, a covenant which they broke, which is why Daniel reiterates again in this verse, 
we have sinned. We have done wickedly. And then finally, in verse 16, he makes his first request. He says, O Lord, in accordance with all your righteousness, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. Now notice that Daniel doesn't say, in accordance with all your mercy, or in accordance with all your grace or your forgiveness, but in accordance with all your righteousness, turn away your anger. Now, some commentators think that Daniel is saying that Israel hasn't been pun- or has been punished enough and that now God would be right to turn around and bless them. But I don't think that that's the case. Next week we'll see that it'll take much more than 70 years of exile to, quote, atone for iniquity, as verse 24 says in this chapter. It will take the death of the Messiah Friends, sin can't be atoned for in a mere 70 years if it can't be atoned for for all eternity in the lake of fire. When Daniel says, in accordance with all your righteousness, he recognizes that there's no contradiction, no injustice between the righteousness of God and his mercy and forgiveness. Somehow, God must be just and the justifier of sinful Israel. He can't just slide all their sin under the rug. That would be unjust. It's not that he won't do that. He can't do that. He is holy. Just like he can't be unfaithful to his promises, he can't forgive sin without the shedding of blood, without the the death of a perfect substitute. Now, did you find it odd that in Ezekiel 36, the Lord says that he will prove the holiness of, of his great name in cleansing them from all their sin, and that he will prove himself holy when he brings them back to their land, having washed them, given them a new heart, and put a new spirit within them. It seems to me that that would be his mercy, but it says it's his righteousness. And friends, because of the life and death of Jesus Christ and him fulfilling the law in perfect obedience and in him dying in the place of sinners, because of him, it is right for God's anger and his wrath to turn away. It is right for God to forgive his people and to bless and to restore and to be in fellowship with those whom he has redeemed as their God and Father. It would be righteous of God to do that and it would prove his holiness. The restoration of Israel is impossible. It is actually unjust were it not for Jesus Christ. And we'll get to that more next week. Now Daniel says, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, and I wonder if Daniel has been subtly implying, Lord, do something about this sin problem. It's because of our sin that all this has happened and we don't want to do it again. He says to the Lord, turn away your wrath from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. That's what it's supposed to be. He's saying, Lord, we are supposed to be a holy people, a holy city. And so, Lord, make it so. Make it so. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Your sanctuary. In Isaiah 64, we read that God has hidden his face from them, and here Daniel prays for his face to shine on them. Well, God doesn't have a face. This is a metaphor. Daniel's asking the Lord to restore proper worship in his sanctuary, which lies desolate. Daniel must have longed to be at the place where God dwells. Just imagine 70 years of looking out your windows toward the place where you long to be but can't go. I think of Psalm 184. The psalmist says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul has longed and even fainted for the courts of the Lord. For better is a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And keep in mind that Daniel's desire to go back to the land is not because he cares about earthly prosperity or anything like that. He has been exalted in Babylon for most of his life, and so that's not his desire. His desire is for God's kingdom to come and to be with his king, worshiping him with his people, and for God's name alone to be glorified among the nations. And so he prays. He says, O my God, 
Incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Hear his passion here. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O oh my God, because of your city, because your city and your people are called by your name. And I am struck by his passion in this prayer, his pleading with God on the basis of who God is and his promise to glorify himself and to make a name for himself in the world. Daniel desperately yearns for the honor and the glory of his God. And I feel that, and I know you do too. You look around at the world and and you see your God, your Savior, your King being dishonored. And if we're going to be passionate about anything, let it be that our sovereign king would be glorified on earth as he is in heaven. Now, the church is not Israel, but we groan too. We also cry out, how long, O Lord, will you refrain from glorifying yourself? Open your eyes and see what the nations are saying about you and your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. See how they are treating your people. See how we are incessantly hounded with our own sin. Lord, restore right worship. Bring your kingdom. Incline your ear and act for your own sake. Come, Lord Jesus. That is a prayer that takes hold of God, a prayer that he delights to answer and will answer because it takes hold of his word and it says, do as you have said. And if the prayer which takes hold of his word or the prayer that takes hold of God, says, do as you have said. Church, how important is it for us to know what he has said? I love this quote by Spurgeon. He said, oh, that you studied your Bibles more. Oh, that we all did. How we could plead the promises. How often we should prevail with God. That's in prayer. When we could hold him to his word and say, fulfill this word unto thy servant, whereon thou hast caused me to hope. Oh, it is grand praying when our mouth is full of God's word, for there is no word that can prevail with him like his own. And that connects to our response for today. What is our response? Well, certainly we are like Daniel to adore God for who he is and we are to search out our sins and confess them before the Lord and we are to make our requests known to him in all humility before a great and awesome and faithful God. But underlying all this, underlying all that we see in Daniel's prayer is the profound understanding of the word of God. Daniel takes hold of God in this prayer because he has taken hold of his word. Yes, adore him. But how can we adore him rightly when we know little of his word? And how can we adore him honestly when we care little to study his word? How can we say, Lord, I love you, and at the same time say, I just don't care much to read the word you've written for me? Friends, take up your Bibles and read. Don't wait for New Year's resolutions, and don't just read the verse of the day. You can't survive on 20 calories a day. Find a system that will saturate you with the word of God. You can't read your Bibles too much, just like you can't worship too much or pray too much. Read Psalm 119, the longest uh, chapter in the Bible, 176 verses on how much he loves the word of God. And it may well be that that psalm was written by Daniel. And as you read... Take hold of the promises that are for you, the church. For as many as are the promises of God in Christ, they are yes. Blessings all mine and 10,000 beside. And as Paul says, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you dwell in inapproachable light, and yet you have come near to sinners like us through the blood of Christ. 
You are gracious and merciful and forgiving and the fount of all love and holiness and joy. And we thank you for your word. What a treasure it has been to your saints throughout all of history. May we also see the treasure that it is to know you, the true God, and Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. Thank you for all the blessings that have come to us through Jesus Christ, though we deserve nothing but eternal judgment. Lord, we should have died in our sins. We had no righteousness of our own. What grace and kindness you have shown to us in making us citizens of your everlasting kingdom. You have magnified your name and you will be glorified among the nations and we long for that day. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the grace, the amazing grace that you have shown to us in Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.